Okay, Revolution Radio, here we go. It is Tuesday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and it is time for the Quantum Leap Show. Let light unite with our goddess spiritual warrior, Kathy Bilski. tuned in to listen to Kathy Bilski. She, uh, her call dropped right before we came on air, and I am trying to get her back, so just uh, hang on. She'll be here shortly. Um, this is Liz, the switchboard operator on Studio B, Kathy's producer, and I told her that I hoped we didn't have any issues tonight because I didn't have any chit chat to roll on with but uh looks like i'm gonna have to pull something out of my hat um kathy's going to have an interesting show tonight uh it's about the anti-war movement and she said it would pertain to about anything that you wanted to use it for and i'm really interested to hear it I know she had a very interesting guest last week, uh, Chad Meek, who was talking about UFOs in his novel. It sounds very interesting, and uh, look him up online. He has a lot to say. Um, still not having any luck with Kathy. I may have to try to call her phone and see if I have any better luck with that. So, hold on, people. Okay. No luck with that. Hello. Okay, now we have Kathy. I'm going to mute my mic and uh, let her get down to business. Thanks, everyone, for hanging on. Well, welcome, everyone. This is Kathy Pilsky, the Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show. It's going to be a great show. They are already censoring me, and they have been censoring me all day. So I guess I got to do my, oh, it's going to suck to be you, trolls, whoever is doing the censoring. And let me remind you about karma. You know, I love starting the show off like this. Okay, so this is going to go how it's going to go. Now, if it's for your highest good, and these are for the people that are censoring, okay? If it's for your highest good, I'm going to go to the karmic board, and I'm going to ask the karmic board if it's for your highest good that you get an instant karmic return of over 100000 for any misdeeds that you're doing to any activist, including me. And guess what? They're friends of mine, and they said, yes, sucks to be you. So now to give you a heads up on what that means everything electrical everything you drive everything it'd be like living a perpetual mercury in retrograde and then it's going to get better if you have and if you are not in harmony with nature i'm going to ask nature to come on in and get involved and I'm going to call to the mice, the rats, the bees, the snakes, the fleas, the centipedes, the spiders, the black widows, the killer bees. And I'm going to invite them all in, ask them if they really would like to join us, infest everything. And that means all your homes, again, your workplace. Everything you touch, your computers, your electrical equipment, your phones, blah, blah, blah. Okay, get in the picture. Oh, it's going to get better. You see me in your dreams. And are just all there. And then my hair is going to turn into snakes. And then I'm going to set my snakes after you, and you're going to run like the wind. Except, you know, there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, because my snakes can shapeshift. They can get bigger, smaller, so they're going to find you no matter where you are. And when they bite you, you're going to turn human. 
You can have feelings, emotions, caring, concerns, you know, that warm, fuzzy stuff that you're trying to avoid. And then it gets better. The venom's going to be so strong that it's going to affect all your generations backwards and forwards, hundreds of thousands of years. And they're going to turn human. I mean, isn't this the best? And not only is this going to be directed at um, whoever the censor is, but this is just going to trail your hierarchy is and who you talk to, the orders, all your bosses. Yeah, nobody gets excluded. Yeah. anti-war movement and actually this is the blueprint that can be used toward any just cause and is written by Scott going to be a long night folks um, she kept cutting in and out and lost the connection again trying to get her back I'm going to have to get Hawk to uh, put some music in for times like this so I can just pull up some music as you can tell, it's lovely late summer in Kentucky by my sniffling. Allergies are in full swing. Uh, and it's absolutely miserable. My voice sounds like it's coming out of my nose, uh, out of my nose, out of my knees, and I apologize for that. Uh, in the meantime, we are getting ready for Hawk Fest here on the farm, and anyone that's listening, it's open to all of the Revolution Radio family. Mike's old band is coming up, and they're going to do, uh, it's been 20 years since they've all been together, and they're going to do their uh, tribute to Ozzy Osbourne, and of course, Hawk is Ozzy and you gotta come for that that's entertainment alone there although I watched him uh, I went to Florida uh, about three years ago with him and they did a tribute and it was very very entertaining I hadn't seen Hawk be the front man for ever since I've known him so he was he was very entertaining. It was very enjoyable, and like I said, it would be worth coming just to see that. They're putting a stage up, and this year we have plenty of different seating. Anyone that was at my farm last year remembers we didn't have a whole lot of outside seating. Well, that's changed. Um, there's going to be lots of food. We're going to have entertainment all day and uh, different people. Uh, we're gonna have a comedian coming in and I have a nephew who is practicing his stand-up. So he's gonna do a, a small show and we'll have different musicians and lots of good food. We're gonna have games and prizes and lots of good conversation from uh, different people who are preppers and so I'm looking forward to it. If I survive that long, just trying to get ready for it is very exhausting. Uh, that will be Labor Day weekend. Saturday's going to be the big entertainment day. <clears throat> so if you can come, it'll be an enjoyable time. Uh, if anyone wants to call in and chat with me till Kathy gets back on, the number is 310-421-4053. Uh, please call in. I, I am running out of chat. And uh, can't seem to get Kathy back. I apologize to everyone. She has dropped offline. And we have a caller. Or we had a caller. Call back in. I've I can't believe this. I have lost Kathy completely. You gotta love the internet. Just gotta love it. All seems to be going good and ba bam. The fun stuff happens. 
Okay, come on. Okay, I see that Kathy is back online. Maybe she will call in since I can't call her. Uh, go ahead and call in Kathy. And she's not going to be happy when she gets back on. I guarantee that. <laughs> I got a ring from somewhere. Could be a surprise call. Let's see. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Hey. Is this who is oh, this? Kathy. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Uh here you go. I'm going to mute and let you go. I told everybody you were going to be furious when you got back on. <laughs> oh, my God. Are we on? Am I on? Well, okay. Yes, you're on. Uh, all right. Let me. Okay. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, how do you like that? Say the name Scott Ritter, and they have problems, don't they? Why? Because the man is brilliant, and they fear him and his words. Why? Because he can help activists be successful. Obviously, they certainly have cut me off from the computer all day long. Now, all of a sudden, my computer has decided to update and install all these updates, okay? He's never done that while I'm doing a show. And they also knocked me off of Skype. So you know how I can say, guys, whoever the censors are, oh, honey, it really sucks to be you and all your bosses. I really feel sorry for you, you know? But it's your choice, and I really, really hope you learn the lesson. All right, so let's get back to waging peace, the art of war for the anti-war movement. Um, I just want to say a little bit that Scott Ritter was one of UN's top weapons inspectors in Iraq between 1991 and 1998. Before working for the UN, he served as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps and as a ballistic missile advisor to General Schwarzkopf in the first Gulf War. And he's offered the author of many books, including Iraq Confidential and Target Iran. Now, what Scott Ritter did was tell the damn truth, and the government didn't like it because they wanted to start a war. And he was just saying, you know, no, there's nothing there to start a war over. So they went after Scott Ritter, and they just about destroyed the man. But, man, that guy's got gumption. And, Scott Ritter, if you are listening to me, please call me. I want to work with you. You are brilliant. And... In the months leading up to the invasion of Iraq, Scott Ritter spent many hours speaking to numerous anti-war forums across the country and around the world, and they all ignored his advice. They all thought they had a really good game plan, right? Well, all I have to say for all you activists out there that didn't listen to this man's brilliant advice, how's your plan working for you? Yeah? Yeah, well, well, I don't know. Let's just take a look at the earth. I don't see where it's stopping. You're not moving forward, are you? You're just kind of spinning your wheels. And if you call that success, you're idiots. And for all the rest of you activists that are out there, I'm going to ask that you take all your preconceived notions of activism, and I want you to just put it up on the shelf and listen to this with open mind. Because unless you get this, the art of war, you're not going to win your cause. Because if you don't think the other side knows this game plan, well, I got news for you. And not only do they know it, but they play it. Now, when I was reading 
this book and why did I come to this? Because I was praying one day and I was asking Spirit, you know, please, what is my next move? What do you want me to do? Show me. And I had Scott's book for a couple of years and wasn't able to pick it up. And all of a sudden there's this book just staring at me. And I want a game plan for quantum leaping the world into enlightenment. How do you create a movement? Yeah, okay. So I picked up his book, and it's if you're an active and anti-war peace activist, you know, you really got to put all your thoughts and feelings and emotions out the door. God, when I get popular, I get popular. Okay. Um, you got to put all your preconceived notions and throw it out the door and really listen to this and his advice with an open mind. Oops, I thought I got that fixed, but I didn't. Okay, there. Wow, how it can ring and I don't even have it connected. It's brilliant. Okay, there we go. Don't you love live radio? It's just one thing after another, huh? Okay, so what I did when I read Scott's book, and like I said, it wasn't easy to read. I had to, so many concepts, because it's not what my mind, I'm not attuned to war and the art of war. So I would read something, and I could see my eyes glaze over, and my mind start to shut down, which is really good. So then I would back away from the book, and I would just go back the next day, and all of a sudden it would be like, aha, I get it. And there were some parts in that book I would read, my, my eyes would glaze over, and my mind would fog up. And I'm going, oh, my God, do I have to know this? And, of course, you know, like he reads our minds and he says, yeah, if you don't learn this concept, it's just not going to work and you're not going to win. And then the other part of me goes, oh, crap. So I set the book down and, you know, get a good night's sleep. And I tackle it the next day and I get it. I want to win. I want you guys to win. And if that means sharing with you everything I put together, um, then I'm going to. And if you want, oh, my, and if you want um, an actually outline of what I'm going to share with you tonight, then go to my website, www.angelightom.com. That's A-N-G-E-L-I-T-E-O-M.com. Look at my address. P.O. Box 69, Popolo, Hawaii, 96780. You know, send me a money order for $3, and I will send you this that covers handling. And this is 18 pages um, of notes that I put together. And as I was putting to get this together, I realized that, my God, everybody can use this. You know, any activist. And if I can make it easy for you then I win. And it's going to make quantum leaping the world into enlightenment a hell of a lot easier. So um, let's get going. And now remember, this is a blueprint that can be used for any just cause. And how you apply it, the knowledge, it's totally up to you. Totally up to you. So first off, you got to realize that all war is based on deception. Now, what Scott Ritter did is he went through and he did a lot of studying on war techniques and all that other good stuff, That and philosophies of those who have mastered the art of conflict. So we're going to talk about also some of those people, and they're like Sun Shu and Clausewitz. Um, and, you know, these guys are brilliant. Okay, and this is again what the other side bases what they're going to do on. Okay, now remember, all war is based on deception. And how often did you go to the other side and went, oh my God, they're lying through their teeth? Well, can we just say, duh? Of course they're going to lie. They want to win. Okay? They're not going to tell you the truth. You cannot be up aboard and up front with these guys 
Because they'll just turn around and take that knowledge and turn it against you. Or they'll know how to make their next move. Oh, what a concept. So first off, you've got to really take in consideration that your movement, first and foremost, has to develop a laser-like focus on your cause, no matter what it is, okay? And one of the things he made the remark is, you know, you see all those peace demonstrations, right? But is it all a demonstration of peace? Now, you've got many people that want to, you know, that are there because of it, but how many groups show up with their own agenda, and that kind of convolutes the message. So be really clear on what your concept and your message is and stick to it. So you want to have strategic thinking, operational planning, sense of sound tactics. You want to implement supporting organized operations. You need to, uh, the ability to recognize opportunities as they emerge. And you need the resources to exploit, exploit those opportunities. And, you know, we as residents of Earth are engaged in a life and death struggle of competing ideologies with those who promote war and everything that goes with it, who promote GMO. And they promote it as an American value and virtue. Okay, so you really have to study, and we're going to call, we're not going to call it the enemy, because I don't like that word, so we're going to use opponent. You need to comprehend the art of campaigning, waging battles only when necessary. You need the ability to wage a struggle on several fronts simultaneously synchronizing each struggle so a synergy is created that maximizes whatever energy is being expended. Now understand the opponent's center of gravity and you design measures to defeat it. Understand your opponent's decision-making cycle and then undertake a course of action to preempt this cycle so you're getting inside their system of making decisions and force them to react to your movement agenda instead of the other way around. So you need to have a think tank that, that produces... produces... Oh, are we back? Okay, okay, I think, I think we're, we're back, back online, online, and I'm, I'm going, going to go, go to Skype. Skype. All right, so we're back on Skype. Woohoo! I love having alternatives. Okay, so simplicity also is the key, is a very big key. But you also want to develop a universal plan of action for everyone in your group where everyone operates the same and coordinated and controlled by whatever your command staff is. And again, simplicity is the key. So when waging your cause, a governing principle is to create an ideal, uh, ideological foundation that can appeal to the broadest possible segment of a given democratic society, mainstream. And believe me, your opponents have a cause, a strategy, and by God, they are fighting to win, aren't they? So when you create a vision statement, you don't want it complicated, you want it concise, to the point, true to the ideals of the organization. And again, you want to gear the vision statement toward achieving 
majority support. You know, this is an all out fight for public opinion. Now the end victory will come only if they successfully craft a message combined with a messenger vehicle that is attractive to the majority. If mainstream cannot identify with the terms of message and membership, there is no chance of winning. And in order to win, you must morph into the mainstream. Now, one example, all right, you want to make it very, very simple. What do the right wingers do? How do you know they you you what you want to do is keep it simple and narrow everything down to describe your cause in three words. Okay. So the three words for the right wingers are God, guns, and gays. And those three words just get everybody's emotions up and gets them all riled up and blah, blah, blah. But it's, and if you notice how the right wing acts and whenever they put out a program, they limit it to three words. Okay. So remember they do God's guns and gays. So think about how you want to make it very simple and pick three words that you're going to use that the mainstream will be able to get and go, yeah, I can do that. I can be a part of that. So you establish a core value that is markable to the majority of population and unquestionable accepted by other workers of your cause. Now, all these ideas and concepts that I'm, I'm sharing with you, they are all created by Scott Ritter. And all I've done is just taken the high points off that, you know, makes it easier for you to get. But boy, I would really recommend getting his book, Waging Peace, Scott Ritter, The Art of War for the Anti-War Movement. Movement, you can get it on Amazon. And I think it was, for me, it costed a buck. I mean, what a bargain. That's when you know it's right. So go and get a copy. Read it. Understand it. And I'm just giving you an outline, okay? Now, what's very, very important is you got to play to win. Now, that's a concept, huh? You want to play to win. So you want people also to sign up to a declared set of values and pursue the implementation of values with a single-minded purpose. And anyone who deviates from the plan can leave the group. Got that? You want everyone cohesive, and working together. And again, anyone who deviates from your plan, you want them to leave the group. Build a team that is capable of winning. So you got to define a center of gravity, a core value that is easily and simply expressed by those marketing it and understood by those receiving it. So if I was going to choose three words for quantum leaping the world into enlightenment, and believe me, I've thought really hard about this, and I can change it. It's nothing written in stone. But my three words would be to describe enlightenment, family, earth, and abundance. And to me, that says it all. And then you have your little one-liners on how do you describe, what does family mean? Unity of all. You make it simple. Earth. Enlightenment. Earth. Healthy earth. Clean earth. And abundance, well, gosh, when everybody's an awakened spiritual being connected to the creator and they know better, you share. 
and everybody will have abundance and whatever they need it will be there all right so let's get back to um the art of war now i love this one if you can sell the, your concept to firefighters then you can sell it to the majority of the people you know win over the firefighters you win over society so what does that mean? You know, put together a concept that you can take to the firefighters and go, guys, what do you think about this? Talk to them about it. They might even help you become more mainstream. You know, those guys are really, really nice people. And they have honor and they're caring. So let's talk about one of... Um, the people that have actually mastered the art of conflict and his name is Sun Tzu. And he said, and I've, I've said this earlier, all warfare is based on deception. Don't expect the other side to tell the truth. Okay. So Sun Tzu said, hence when able to attack, we must seem unable when using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the proponent believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. Now there's a general um, during World War II whose name is Clausewitz. And he says, if the enemy is to be coerced, you must put him in a situation that is even more unpleasant than the sacrifice you call on him to make. Now, they do this to us all the time when they want us to vote for presidency, huh? They give us someone who looks okay, and then they put in opposite someone who is absolutely just so bad. They know there's no way in hell we're going to vote for him, and we're going to vote for the other guy. Okay? Simple playbook. The hardships of the situation must not be merely transient at least not in appearance. Otherwise, the opponent would not give in, but would wait for things to improve. And then we've got General Gray, whose expertise is in maneuver warfare. So maneuver warfare is a war fighting philosophy that seeks to shatter the opponent's cohesion through a variety of rapid, focused, and unexpected actions, which create a turbulent and rapid deteriorating situation the enemy cannot cope. Now there's something called the ODA loop, and it's O-O-D-A-L-O-O-P. And in order to win, you need to operate at a faster tempo or rhythm than your opponents. And you get inside the opponent's observation, orientation, decision, action time cycle, or loop. Oda loop. Observation, orientation, decision, action, time cycle, or loop. Such activity makes you appear unpredictable, thereby generating confusion and disorder among the opponents. So the goal of the Oda loop is to simultaneously compress your time and stretch out the adversary's time to generate a favorable mismatch in time ability to shape and adapt to change. You also want to shorten your own
decision-making cycle while increasing that of one's opponent. In order to adapt to change, one cannot be passive. You need variety, rapidity, harmony, and initiative. And when you have those, you'll function on a tighter decision-making cycle. So then you have the Chen and Qi, Shen and Qi of combat. So Shen maneuvers will expose an adversary's weakness, which is exploited by a decisive stroke of Qi. Now Sun Tzu says rapidity, rapidity, harmony, initiative, collective. Now his main focus was on the spiritual act, aspects of war, whereas Clausewitz, his main focus was on the emotional. This is where you maneuver your opponent into a position where his weaknesses are exposed. And then you exploit those weaknesses with a well-timed decisive blow. Now this maneuver can be political as well as physical, invoking the moral and intellectual as well as brute force. And then we have Colonel John Boyd, who is an Air Force fighter pilot. And again, this guy was brilliant. And now he was also the father of modern maneuver war warfare. And he says, he who is willing and able to take the initiative to exploit variety, rapidity, and harmony as the basis to create as well as adapt to more indistinct, more irregular, quicker changes of rhythm and pattern, yet shape the focus and direction of effort, survives and dominates. Now the opposite holds true. He who is unwilling or unable to take the initiative to exploit variety, rapidity, and harmony goes under or survives to be dominated. So you want an organic synthesis collective of variety, rapidity, and harmony initiative that will enable you to conduct decision-making more dynamic, efficient manner than one's opponent. Once you operate inside, and means quicker than an, appoint, an opponent's decision-making cycle, the Oda loop, the resulting friction creates uncertainty, confusion, doubt, disorder, fear, panic, and ultimately chaos, which paralyzes an opponent into indecision and defeat. Now, how do you put this Oda loop into execution? So I'm going to go through some of the key elements, okay? So the first key element of the Oda loop is observation. Seeing, sensing, comprehending one's own environment as well as that of one's opponent. Essential, essential to be intimately aware of any factors that might have a bearing on your ability to rationally assess a situation and ideally to possess a similar insight into limitations or lack of your opponents. The second elemental is orientation. The objective positions of oneself in relation to observation made. So you need a distinct need for a high level of self-awareness during this space, being able to adapt and change or hold true when needed. The third element is deciding. The selection of a given course of action derived from observation made and subsequent orientation of oneself. So this can be a complex process of analysis and synthesis before selecting a course of action. And then you've got the fourth element, action. And that's simply doing, 
that which has been decided on. Now, once an action has been taken, the Oda loop begins anew with the decider reorientating in relation to the problem, incorporating all new factors that might have emerged in the most recent cycling of the Oda loop, and you repeat until opponent is defeated. So the ideal application of the Oda loop takes place simultaneously at multiple levels. And any organization that can find and adopt the means to reduce friction will in the end have the means to, the sooner you can get moving, the sooner you can reduce your accumulation of friction. The more you force your opponent to react to your initiative, the more friction is accumulated for the opponent. So decision-making means achieving motion, creating the condition under which movement can take place. And motion, well, that's the process that creates friction. And it's better to begin a conflict already in motion than to be standing still. Now, if one is in motion, the amount of force required to achieve a change in direction, assuming one is maintaining a forward movement, is less than if one begins from a full stop. Action is better than reaction. So action produces less friction than reaction. If you gain the initiative on an opponent and enter a cycle where you act and the opponent reacts. And then you have the laws of motion which dictate an accumulation of friction on an opponent, opponent which equals spiral of defeat as you tighten your decision making cycle and the opponent widens his. So you master the Oda loop and you master conflict. So we're gonna talk about what is called the IPS and that's intelligence preparation of the battlefield. So what the IPS is, a system approach to analyzing the enemy, the weather or terrain of a specific area now, this enables one to selectively apply and maximize whatever defines one's strengths at critical times and location, wherever an ideological struggle is being waged. So you have four distinct phases here. You define your battlefield environment. You describe the battlefield effects. You evaluate the threat and you determine the threat course of action. So defining the battlefield environment can mean you describe the ideals and beliefs that are being held by those for, for whom the struggle is being waged. And remember, ideological warfare is a numbers game. So the battlefield could be the mass of people each side is trying to win over to their cause. So you make sure your location is in a community or location that is ideologically similar to your cause. Now, is that a no-brainer or what? You know, when you're doing your work, you want to make it as easy for yourself as you can, right? Okay. So you also want to identify all the technology that can be used. Emails, web pages, blogs, cell phones, faxes, TV, radio, etc. And of course, you have the traditional, the town meetings, your lectures, seminars, teach-ins, or you do a combination of both. But it's important to understand 
how each means is already established in any given area before assigning a priority use. So if that area doesn't have email, right? No internet, there's no point in doing email work, is there? And sending flyers out to people who have internet is definitely a waste of time, okay? So now what is the ideological conflict and what does that mean? Well, okay. Who is the opponent? What do they represent? How do they function? Why do they believe in what they do? Now, you cannot solve the problem until you define this. And as you evaluate the threat, this determines courses of actions. So again, this is important. You want to identify your opponent understand what the opponent stands for, understand how your opponent operates, what socioeconomic segment is attracted to the opponent's cause and why. Become familiar with your opponent's doctrine. If you can predict an opponent's action, you can anticipate their response. So you take action based on, on fact. The IPB, Intelligence Preparations of the Battlefield, enables an opponent's possible course to be assessed. Which way are they going? What do you think? It enables responses to be formulated in advance. So if opponent does behave in that model you've set up, you can identify and act on it in more expedient and an efficient manner. So additional tools used in the IPB process, and that means intelligent preparation of the battlefield. It's called event templating. So this is a model against which opponent's activity can be recorded and compared. This enables one to take a known about what an opponent is capable of doing and compare it with what is actually being done. This assists in predicting what an opponent may do next. So it's very important in, the, in determining what an opponent is up to. So another IPB tool, Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield tool, is named in area of interest. And you know, they like to use you know, letters, so it's called NAI, named area of interest. So as visualization of opponents' capabilities and likely course of action develops, critical focal factors become apparent both in terms of actual physical location and ideological viewpoints or whatever factors are being measured. So resulting that significant events and activities will either take place at the designated locations or about the identified issues. NAI is a resource consuming task and should be limited to the ability of an organization to do the job. So keep your focus, don't get distracted. If done right, the NAI designating monitoring equals data that is critical to understanding the area of conflict and the opponent. NAI supports decision support template or DST, decision support template. So this is a basic cause effect analysis that identifies specific criteria that must occur before one initiates a particular action. So DST could track public opinion concerning a specific issue in a given region, triggering a release of resources or initiate a PR campaign when certain thresholds are met. DSTs bring discipline to a decision-making process. 
part of a system, system that anticipates enemy actions and develops effective responses that speed up the decision-making process and makes it more e Oh, nope, I can't hear. I think we're doing a station break. All right, we'll be back and um, we will go through more of this, the art of war. Welcome back, everybody. This is Kathy Bilski, the Quantum Leap, Let Light Unite show on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And Revolution Radio is a listener-sponsored show, and nobody gets paid for coming on and doing our shows or anything um, that has to do with the station. So we really appreciate all the donations that you send. And just go to their website at Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com and They've got a donation button, and everything is really, really greatly appreciated. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be having shows like this on the air. And if you want to get more um, information about me, you can go to my website at www.angelitom.com. That's A-N-G-E-L-I-T-E-O-M.com. And... I've got all some really lovely angel light healing products there, and I've gotten a couple books that I've written. One you can get, download for free, and they're spiritual basic books. You can also download my Curse Removal Energy Balancing for free, and that's what I call the maintenance program, and you're able to do it for your friends and your relatives. And if you want a copy of this outline, then go ahead and send me $3.00 which will cover the cost of um, copying and postage. And I'll send you out this outline that I'm going through tonight that Scott Ritter really wrote in his book called Waging Peace, The Art of War for the Anti-War Movement. And that's what we're talking about tonight. How, in, how can you take your cause and actually win and have some forward movement. And if you're not having some forward movement at all, then you really need to change your strategies and your tactics. So I hope many of you have learned something so far with what I've shared, because I have a lot more to share with you. And when I talk about opponent and, you know, like the art of war, I hope you're not closing down and, you know, glazing over. Because if you do, the other side's won. And I really, really encourage you, if you really want to win, to pick up Scott Ritter's book called Waging Peace, The Art of War for the Anti-War Movement. Amazon's got it, and it's not a lot of money. I think, you know, you can get even some copies for a dollar. I mean, does it get any better? Give me a break. It's a blueprint for winning your cause. So we've talked about, you know, some things that are very, very important that you need to do that he really recommends, you know, the Oda loop, which is rip, 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 rip. Yeah, I even have to look it up. Um, it's a big decision making process where you understand what's going on inside your opponent's world and that's observation orientation decision action time cycle or loop and then under that is just like how how you actually put it together and you know hopefully eventually this will also go on youtube so you can listen to it and make some notes and help your cause go forward so clausewitz you know we've talked about you know like a few men that have really mastered the arts of war and one of them is Clausewitz and his importance you know he really thought more of the importance of psychological factors in conflict okay human spirit and morale were much more decisive factors on the battlefield than formation and lines on a map so that really means he thought of what fatigue would happen, danger, decisiveness, boldness, determination, and audacity of impact on, on a conflict in a, a far deeper way. So the perfection of strategy 
would be to produce a decision without any serious fighting. I like that phrase myself. The perfection of strategy would be to produce a decision without any serious fighting. So it's also important to have an agreed upon single point of reference that all parties are working from as their motivator and basis of moral authority. It's like I said, if you're going to do an anti-war group, then you want everybody to be focused on anti-war. You know, that's if you're going to come into the group. This is what they're going to do. They're not going to bring their GMO work in. They're not going to bring their water work in, nothing like that. It's going to be focusing on anti-war or focusing on quantum leaping the world into enlightenment and whatever that means. So Sun Tzu said, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So now we have strategy, operation, tactics, which is called campaigning. So strategy, you have the science and art, operation, performances and actions, tactics, devices, and methods. Stro so strategic thinking means the big picture. And for that, you want in one overall boss, or you might call him the director. You have operational action. So it takes the goals of the strategic thinking and breaks them down into separate functioning units, which means, you know, whoever is in charge, now you've got your managers or your division heads, which you, you know, give them the tasks and they in turn pass it down the line. So your tactics are the building blocks of operation, specific actions that get things done. And that would include your team leaders or the section heads. Now, there's got to be a distinct differentiation between those who devise and implement strategy and those that execute strategy in the form of tactics. So that means whoever's in charge, that's where you put your focus on. Now, that doesn't mean you're also in charge and you go hand out flyers and you go in the battle. You know, you're in the demonstration at the head of the line, which is why they always kept all the generals and all those big honchos out when they, left, when they let everyone do the battles, right? But like I said, just have a distinct differentiation between those <clears throat> who devise and implement strategy and those that execute strategy in the form of tactics. So now you have what's called a direct assault. Now this provokes a stubborn resistance, thus intensifying the difficulty of producing a change of outlook. The indirect approach involves the conversion of ideas achieved by unsuspected infiltration of a different idea or by an argument that turns the flank of instinctive opposition. And again, you really have to remember that all war is based on deception. And let's just take the Skull and Bone Secret Society. And it is well known that whatever they say, they mean the opposite. It's kind of like the President of the United States saying, we are going to um, make Hawaii and all your reefs and all that and all the, the ocean around it protected area, right? And then with the next breath, they should send the, enemy, the Navy in to do war games. I mean, hello. So all war is based on deception. The supreme excellence is to subdue the armies of your opponent without fighting a battle. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. 
The best course of action is one that encourages the enemy to do what they want to do. And you have insight to your opponent's goals and objectives. Anything that impedes their ability to achieve goals will have a detrimental impact on the opponent themselves. And remember, conflict is friction, and friction consumes resources. Tactics employed should not be designed to increase friction brought upon activists, but to increase friction within the opponent's cycle. Tactics should also minimize any friction between activists and public and increase friction between the opponent and public. You want strategy, which will put together your operation, which creates tactics from that. So discipline approach to examine issues in a logical way from ideological core to practical implementation. You need a system of feedback to monitor action to see if getting if you're getting the desired results or if you have to change. And if you do, you've, it's going to require new benchmarks to be established and monitored. So your strategic direction means keep to your core value and concepts. As tactics go into effect, it must be continuously evaluated against this performance benchmark. So if you don't have any progress, change your tactic. Be careful to trace the new circumstances back to the strategic direction before redefining the objective. This will ensure continuity of purpose and ideal. Link between strategy and tactics is operations. All must be brought into harmony with one another. Understanding and cap capturing the synergy created by multiple battles is the art of the campaign. A single battle usually becomes a fight of attrition from which the side with the greater resources emerges victorious. A, cam a, cam uh, a campaign brings maneuver into the equation, allowing a side with fewer resources to use feint, redirection, speed, and movement to pick a battle at a time and place of its choosing in which temporary superiority in numbers can be achieved. If sequenced correctly, the battles can wear down a superior force over time until the side that initially started as the inferior in numbers emerges victorious. Now, what is a successful campaign? Well, it requires strong continuity among strategy, operations, and tactics. It demands effective decision-making and mastery of the ODA loop. You need a detailed knowledge of your opponent, yourself, and the terrain where campaign is being waged. Each battle fought to achieve a specific purpose that sets in motion forces that were identified in core and incorporated into the next battle and so on until culminating in the decisive event. A, sec a successful campaign means nothing is left to chance. Everything is carefully planned out. Cause-effect relationship to create predictable opportunities that are then rapidly exploited before the opponent can react. 
So what's an ideal campaign? Well, it's where so much friction was created simply through a maneuver that wears out the opponent without a single battle fought. And anyone can win a single battle. Only someone who has mastered all aspects of the art of war can fight and win a, camp a campaign. So B.H. Liddell Hart said, if you want peace, understand war. So now you need an organization and what's called organization and incident command. Now, there's something called flatlining in an organization. And what that means, that means allowing everyone to make decisions. Yeah? Everyone's a chief. And if you want to break through that, you need to come up with something that sends a shock through all and generates a linear deviation away from the flat line model. Accept the concept that there must be those that lead and those that follow. So who is actually to command your group? Well, what's really recommended is that you look up and study Incident Command Center Basis IS-100. And this is a FEMA program that you can um, do and get online for free. So what does this do? It adopts and brings conformity to your group. It helps you define your terms to bring more conformity to the group. Like I said, each definition, one word, so there is conformity and everyone understands meanings. So whatever you do in Australia, it's the same process and they're going to have the same understanding in Africa. So you want to keep it simple and reduce friction. Reduce friction and speed the process. Speed the process and defeat the opponent by getting inside their decision-making cycle. So now, roles and responsibilities. Now remember, you got to accept the concept that there are those that lead and those that follow. So there's one commander, one boss. And then the functions are broken down into or organizational entities, everyone operating within their framework of assigned a task. So you do not get involved in other areas where you have no business in. If you don't have that assignment, don't take it upon yourself to do it. If you do, now you are not using your resources correctly. Okay? Okay. So you have one commander for any given situation, the rest are followers. If there is an attempt to operate with multiple commanders, this means that the well-defined fractures in place can be exploited by your opponent or just simply human nature. So you don't want multiple commanders, okay? And then you've got the unity of command. Again, one commander and the followers operate as a team. And the commander must be able to subordinate personal gain for the good of the team. Those who seek leadership positions for personal glory only doom themselves and their team to failure. Create a unified training program that has the support of all involved that prepares everyone for all rigors of conflict. So it must be unified so someone, again, training in Hawaii can integrate with a group trained anywhere else. A key element in such training is unity, which brings with it uniformity of terms and definitions. 
So you might want to create what's called the Activist 1, the standard manual. And then you've got Activist 2, Activist 3, and 3, Advanced Training, which is organizing activism, including communications, logistics, and information processing. So we're back to the Incident Command System, ICS. This is Organizational Management system for all emergency responses. So incident can mean a demonstration, fundraising, organizing meeting to coordinate internet communications. So the ICS, the Incident Command System, brings people together in a unified movement. And again, the FEMA ICS training is for free online at www.training.fema.gov slash capital E-M-I-W-E-B slash I-S slash I-S 100 dot A-S-P. And then they actually have a follow-up course, which is the I-S 200, Incident Command for Single Resources and Initial Accidents. And this just enables different organizations to meld effectively into a single entity. So you master the ICS and you apply more effectively is a major step in getting inside opponent's decision-making cycle, the OTA loop. So key element in training is unity which brings with it uniformity of terms and definitions. Create a standards organization, one that has widespread membership and acceptance. And you can even create an online course. So under this, we have personal personnel support units, also known as PSU. So the basic grant units you know, you could lead with 20 persons organized into three to six person sub teams with a team leader and a deputy leader. Now, this is great if you need people to pass out pamphlets. You mobilize a personnel support unit. Need demonstration support. You mobilize a PSU. So a PSU could become the infantry of movement. So type 1 PSU can mobilize within a week's notice to deploy on its own for up to seven days without a 500, within a 500-mile radius. And, for example, type 2 PSU, which you're going to put together, means all of the above. That's people that can mobilize within a week's notice, deploy on its own for up to seven to days within a 500-mile radius, but they need transportation. So if you're planning a demonstration, you want 200 people. So that means if you got this all set up, you would call to 10 of your PCU units and there you've got 200 people because there's 20 people each. So then you have incident command teams, which is ICT. And this is a trained command staff with commander logistics chief operations chief, media chief, and all other staff functions built in. And the teams deployed to support a given event or incident or demonstration. ICT could be classified based on the size of the event to be managed. And then you have command support team, CST. And these are teams of 10 people capable of providing cell phones fax, internet support for up to five support units, which is, what, 100 people. CSTs can be type classified as required. Then you've got transportation support teams, TST. Now this supports your PSU. And what was PSU? Personal support unit with basic transportation requirements. And then you can have a food support team, FST. 
teams to, to sustain a given number of personal, personal support units with food and beverage for a specific deployment length. So then you also can have media support teams, legal support teams, medical support teams, shelter support teams, information support teams, analytical support teams, or anything else you can come up with. Now, what about the people who ask, what can I do? Well, have them fill out a form, a capabilities form, an offering sheet, and have them submit it to the nearest activist organization. And they'll contact whoever is in charge of interviews who will then direct the volunteers to the organization that can use their skills. And they may even be asked to join a personal support unit or a transportation support team or whatever is out there that, you know, they've got those skills for. And if a group wants to work together, well, make sure you contact that organization and be very, very specific that you are capable of working together as a unit. Now, there's a group out there called the National Concerned Citizen Activism Association, and the NCCAA creates a standard used in movement where activists meet basic requirements as set forth in standard. So the NCCAA will assist a team in getting basic training required and then work with your team to certify them as mission capable. So, for example, you can have an activist one, a possible line course where people also study and complete the FEMA. And actually, when you complete the FEMA courses, you get a certificate. So activists two and three, after you pass the more advanced training and more specialized skills set in the organization, activities, communication, logistics, and information processing, so you could also have task books created for each position past activist one, listing observable skills derived from specific training that are to be evaluated by a competent authority. And, you know, usually it helps if someone in the chain of command has actually, you know, taken the test and they have knowledge once a certain competency in activism is attained, people can then seek to specialize in their qualifications. So by creating an NCCAA-like organization and putting in place a defined structure creates more opportunity for people to get involved. By getting involved as part of an organizational team structure, the new activists can multiply their effectiveness by reducing friction and expense of activism. Getting involved as an organized team equals more efficiency, means reduce friction, means reduce and reduces expenses of activism. You're not duplicating your efforts. You're more efficient and you're not wasting your resources. So the better you're organized, it streamlines your activities to better identify what needs to be done. Organized resources need to get the job done that will oversee the timely and efficient implementation of tasks. So a key tool for developing specifics are simulations or wargaming. Oh, God, I can hear everyone groan. Well, but what does that mean? So you develop simulation that tests your theories before putting your ideas into practice. So, for example, you evaluate past incidents involved and attempted to recreate one or more in simulation form. So you assign different roles to personnel involved, replay the incident over and over, identifying critical nodes and activities highlight what went right 
as well as wrong. And really be honest and leave out no relevant detail. Now create organizational structures to deal with identified shortfalls and successes. How will these new organizational structures have a positive impact on your missions and objectives? For example, plan on a demonstration. Well, it helps to war game it ahead of time in order to anticipate your needs as well as the reaction of the opponent. This reduces friction and speeds up the decision making. So you're going back to the ODA loop again. You anticipate opponents' possible responses to a given course of action, immediately identify the course. This creates a response to maintain the advantage throughout the engagement. Simulations can help prepare in advance for as many contingencies as possible. So let's talk about winning. Well, victory doesn't just happen. It's produced through effort, sometimes extraordinary effort. And remember, in conflict, your opponent is determined to win. And he's looking for any signs of weakness on your part and will exploit those weaknesses with as much decisiveness and ferocity as they can. And if you're not prepared to confront such opponent, don't enter the field of battle. Conflict is not for the faint of heart. In conflict, you must prepare to knock the opponent down. And instead of offering a helping hand, you hold your foe down with your heel of your foot while you plunge the bayonet into his or her heart. Because believe me, they will do the same to you. Now, I know for all of you, you go, oh my God, I can't do that, okay? And I have to admit, when I read this, I mean, I went, okay, I could probably put and hold my foe down and put a spiked heel <laughs> on his neck to hold him down. I don't know if I can plunge a bayonet into his her heart, okay? Well, okay, let me put this into another way instead of that way, okay? You need to be prepared to destroy your opponent's idea and their ability to sustain and spread their ideas. All right, does that make it a little bit more plottable? So you knock down your opponent's ideas. You don't offer any kind of helping hand. Make it easy on them. And you destroy their ability to sustain and spread their ideas. People who wage for their cause must be ferocious in their determination to prevail. Conflict cannot be entered into half-heartedly. And remember, this is a battle for the earth and all life forms and their future, our future. So there is no second place in this struggle, only victory. Victory comes from those who prepare to win. So here's some simple steps on winning, all right? One, prepare yourself for conflict by recognizing the reality of conflict. Two, establish a solid foundation from which to wage conflict by identifying your center of gravity. Three, understand that conflict is fluid, that proactive movement trumps reactive movement and that all movements generate friction. The side that generates less friction usually prevails. Four, decision making is the key to reduce friction. Being able to make decisions faster than opponent is therefore a key to victory. The ODA loop must be mastered. Know your opponent as well as you know yourself. 
Know the terrain upon which a battle will be fought. Anticipate your opponent's actions through a thorough understanding of how they fight. Make your opponent do what they are inclined to do by anticipating his. And by anticipating this, you will be able to set a trap that facilitates their destruction. Six, strategy and tactics in isolation are recipes for disaster. Strategies and tactics linked through operational thinking provide the tools for winning. Seven, conflict is more than a single battle. Be prepared to wage a series of battles in order to emerge victorious. Link these battles together in a synergistic fashion, creating a campaign that highlights your strengths while exploiting the weaknesses of your opponent. And eight, be decisive in victory. Dominate and destroy your, your opponent. His ideas and his plans. Now remember, winning like losing is a learned behavior. And commanders seek smaller proving battles or raids which not only exercise the troops, but condition them to win. Conflict is very much psychological. Moral defeat is far more devastating than physical defeat. By learning to win, you're teaching your opponents to lose. Develop skills needed to, for achieving victory by conducting realistic simulations of conflict in which all aspects of the coming battle are war and gamed in advance. If you stumble in a strategic opportunity, be able to predict the next step and effectively prepare for it. So examine a few other successful movements, okay? What worked? What could have been done differently? When could it have been done? Why should it have not been done? Examine the, process, the progressive movement, but also those of the opponent. Why did the opponent do what they did? When were decisions made by your opponent? What influenced those decisions? How might you, your movement better exploit the opponent's weaknesses? How can your movement minimize your opponent's strength? So remember also, allies are very important in conflict and by expanding the base support among all people. And remember, you know, those are not allies, but supporters. Supporters are permanent. Allies are temporary. Each conflict, each battle must be evaluated from the standpoint of who will be affected by what. Seek out those who would be naturally sympathetic to your cause. Nullify those who are inclined to be in sympathy with your opponent. Now, we've talked about this man before, and this is Saul Alinsky, and through what's called the Industrial Activities Foundation, Saul Alinsky was able to help the working class communities organize into community councils, which were able to provide basic services to those in need. Then turn the masses into real political power. So he embraced strong leadership, organizational structured, and centralized decision making. The political end result of feel good, participatory, participatory democracy in which one waits in hope for the collective to deliver on the false promise of the brotherhood of mankind. Done. Saul Alinsky preached citizen participation, where those in need organize and take care of it themselves. Importance of bringing structure and organization together with unity of purpose and command in order to empower the people to successfully confront the systematic advantages enjoyed by the privileged privilege class in a capitalistic society and to help them inspire them to actively change their own circumstances. So let's go through really quickly 
Saul Alinsky's 12 Rules for Radicals. Number one, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Power is derived from two main sources, money and people. Have-nots must build power from flesh and blood. These are two things in which there is plentiful supply. Government and corporations always have a difficult time appealing to people and usually do so with almost exclusively with economic arguments. Two, never go outside the expertise of your people. It results in confusion, fear, and retreat. Feeling secure adds to the backbone of anyone. Organizations under attack wonder why radicals don't address the real issues. This is why. They avoid things in which they have no knowledge. Three, whenever possible, go outside the expertise of the enemy. Look for ways to increase insecurity, anxiety, and uncertainty. This happens all the time. Watch how many organizations under attack are blindsided by seemingly irrelevant, irrelevant arguments, which they are then forced to address. Four, make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. If the rule is that every letter gets a reply, send 30,000 letters. You can kill them with this because no one possibly obey all their own rules. And this is a serious rule. The besieged entity's very credibility and reputation is at stake because if activists catch it lying or not living up to its commitments, they can continue to chip away at the damage. Five, ridicule is man's most potent weapons. There is no defense. It's irrational. It's infuriating. It also works as a key pressure point to force the enemy into concessions. Petty, crude, rude, and mean. Huh? Well, they want to create any anger and fear. How many times do they do it out there to activists? Ridicule. Right? And it's also said that Really, you stop going after the organizations. You can't touch really the organizations. You got to start going after the people that run the organizations. Six, a good tactic is one your people enjoy. They'll keep doing it with our urging and come back to do more. They're doing their thing and will even suggest, suggest better ones. Radical activists in this sense, are no different than any other human beings. We all avoid unfun activities, but we reveal and enjoy the ones that work and bring results. Seven, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. Don't become old news. Even radical activists get bored. So to keep them excited and involved, organiz organizers are constantly coming up with new tactics. Rule eight, keep the pressure on, never let up. Keep trying new things to keep the opposition off balance. As the opposition masters one approach, hit them from the flank with something new. Attack, attack, attack from all sides, never giving the reeling organization a chance to rest, regroup, recover, and re-strategize. Nine, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Imagination and ego can dream up many more consequences than any activist can. Perception is reality. Large organizations always prepare a worst-case scenario, sometime, something that may be the furthest from the activist's mind. The upshot is that the organization will expend enormous time and energy creating in its own collective mind the direst of conclusions. The possibilities can easily poison the mind and result in demoralization. That's kind of like me um, reminding these trolls how karma works. Ten, if you push a negative hard enough, it will push through and become a positive. Violence from the other side can win the public to your side because the public sympathizes with the underdog and use, unions use this tactic, you know, peaceful but loudly. Demonstrations during the heyday of unions in the early to mid 20th century, in, and they incurred management's wrath, often formed violence that eventually brought 
public sympathy to their side. 11. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. Never let the enemy score points because you're caught without a solution to the problem. You know what they say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Activist organizations have an agenda. Their strategy is to hold a place at the table, to be given a forum to wield their power, so they have to have a compromise solution. Rule 12, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Cut off the support network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after people, not the institutions. People hurt faster than institutions. Again, this is cruel, but very effective. Direct, personalized criticism and ridicule works. So I want to give a big thank you for Scott Ritter for putting all this wonderful information together so activists can be very, very successful. And I strongly urge you to go and buy Scott's book, Waging Peace, The Art of War for the Anti-War Movement. Read it, study it, take it apart, go do the FEMA courses. If you want a copy of the outline, go to my website at www.angelightome.com. Send me a message that you do. My address is Post Office Box 69. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Papaloa, P-A-P-A-A-L-O-A, -A 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 Hawaii, 96780. Send me $3.00. And I'll send you a copy of this, and that covers mailing. And, you know, it's actually 18 pages. Very easy to read. Very easy outline to follow. And then you figure out how you can implement all these awesome suggestions. And if you read his book, I have to say after I have, ah, I can see over and over again, how these, how the other side, the government has employed these tactics. Over and over again. And like I said, remember, they've got an agenda, they have a strategy, and they want to win. So you got to become a hard ass if you want to win. Change your, your strategy. Look at it differently. Plan it as a campaign with many battles that's going to be fought that come together synergistically. Well, I hope all this information really helped you and you can use it. And I don't see how, why anyone can't use this information that was compiled by Scott Ritter. And again, I thank him. And Scott, if you hear me and if you hear this, I hope you're happy. And please contact me. I really, really want to work with you. You rock. You're my hero. And really, any, any organization that has Scott Ritter in their group cannot lose. I mean, this is a guy that also is a master of tactics and war. You can tell by what he put together to help us win so no more wars will be fought. And we can shift the planet Earth. And that's quantum leaping the world into enlightenment. The more successful you are in your cause, the more successful the Earth is. And that's enlightenment. It makes my job easier. So, you know, to me, <laughs> this was me being selfish and putting this out because I want you to be successful. And you know it's important because... The mofos kept, didn't want this on air. And they kept, and they were, in every way possible, trying to keep all this knowledge out there. But, you know, it's too late. 
And it's going to be put more, I'm going to put it out more and share this knowledge. If you go to my Facebook page, I'll also have it out there. And when this goes up on YouTube, I'll combine it together. So you'll have the outline and the program. Do get the book. I, I can't say that enough. And I know for me it was hard to read because I've got to understand new new concepts and ideas. But if you want to win, you got to broaden your mind and you got to do it. You know, don't keep yourself in a box. Expand. And when you open yourself up to new possibilities, the ideas and the thoughts and everything you need will come. And also, again, if you want more information, you can go to my website at www.angellightom.com, A-N-G-E-L-I-T-E-O-M.com. And I've got my curse removal. I'm sorry we didn't have time to do that tonight. I'll definitely... Get that in next week, the curse removal energy balancing. But you can download it on my website for free. And you can do it over and over again, which, like I said, it's the maintenance program. Check out my angel light healing tools. Anybody can be a healer, and it really helps you release pain and stress very, very quickly. Anybody can be a healer. And a lot of my um, activism stuff I put out also on Facebook. You can find me on Google+. Plus. Um, and Facebook, I put out all those prayer power prayers and you can also join us because there's always something to do, isn't there? You know, it's like just when you think you've got it together over here, something pops up over here. So we welcome your energy. We welcome the people to come in and join us. The more people that give the positive prayers and energy work the energy needed to go forward, the quicker we're going to leap into con- into enlightenment. And when we're enlightened, that means everyone is reconnected to the creator. And when you're reconnected to the creator, you're an awakened spiritual being that knows better. You have compassion. You have love. You have kindness. You see the beauty in the earth. You care about people. And that's how I see the earth is going to become, and it is becoming. And with that note, I bid you aloha. Come to Hawaii, come check me out in Honoka'a, and we'll catch you next week.